Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, broadcaster and analyst for CBS Sports. On today's episode, we have an NWSL draft preview, our big board. Quick reminder, the NWSL draft is one week away. It's taking place Thursday, January 12th, and Attacking Third has you covered. Download Follow, subscribe, like, and comment on A3. Subscribe to us on YouTube and give our videos a thumbs up. YouTube.com slash Attacking Third. Get exclusive NWSL draft content right here on Attacking Third. We're a week out. Can you believe it? Hello and good morning if you're joining us live. Hello and good morning to you, buddy. How you doing? Hey, good morning. Um, It's good to be here. Good to be joining you live and everyone that's on YouTube with us. Um. I'm excited because one week away from the draft, one week away from finding mm-hmm. out who's going to be the next big class of the NWSL. Because when you look back, um, our, our social media for Attacking Third has been doing a really cool job of highlighting some of the past number one draft picks and what they've been able to do. And, and you look at some of those players like Naomi Gurma last year, Sophia Smith in 2020, um, Emily Fox in 2021. These are players that have gone on uh, to the national team to make incredible impacts at their clubs. It's really exciting. It's the term of a page it's the start of a new chapter it's the start of the 2023 season for the nwsl i'm thrilled and i'm stoked to be here and to chat with you about it look i always love chatting all things nwsl i love doing that uh alongside you here on a3 and i cannot cannot wrap my head around the fact that this is essentially our our draft episode i mean uh, we've we've been chatting about the draft off mic, I feel like for for quite some time. And before we knew it, we rang in the new year, and it's officially 2023. We're celebrating this is a World Cup year, but uh, now we are also looking ahead and hitting the ground running with uh, with NWSL. So one week away, uh, draft is going to be held in Philadelphia this year at the uh, United Soccer Coaches Convention, right at the Convention Center. Again, Thursday, January 12th, um, you can get all kinds of exclusive coverage with us right here on Attacking Third. And uh, a little bit of breaking news, we're both going to be there. We will be in attendance at the NWSL draft, so we're very excited to to share that news with you all. And uh, make sure you tune in for all sorts of coverage. It's going to start live at 6 p.m. Eastern on CBS Sports Network, Paramount Plus, and CBS Sports HQ, and it's exciting time. It's incredibly exciting. Yeah, I mean, we'll be there. I'm excited to talk about it, um, doing live stuff. So everyone, be sure to follow, download, subscribe, Attacking Third. That way you get all of our draft coverage because this year's a, a little different with the draft because um, – the player registration is open and it's been open for a bit. It actually closes on January 9th, Monday, January 9th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, but this year, players under the age of 18 can enter the NWSL draft. And that's a first because there's been a lot of chit chat about the discovery process, how we get younger players into the league, um, why it wasn't available before. But now it's there. We talked about it when these rules first dropped. Uh, maybe a month or so ago, but players under the age of 18, they can enter the draft. Each team is limited to only two players under 18. Um, Their contract must be signed within 30 days of them being on the roster, and the contract must run through the season in which they turn 18. They can't be waived or traded until the player turns 18. The parents are going to live with them or the guardian has to live with them when they go to that club. Um, There's a lot of little caveats there just to make sure that the under 18 players are safe and ready to go, but there are still players signing up and registering for the draft there's a list on nwsl.com that everyone can go and look at it's a live list that's updating uh that everyone can check out because there's a lot of people registered there are a lot of players registered there's a lot of college players that want to get in um and it's incredibly competitive to get into this yeah i mean when the preliminary list of players dropped it was i think just over 90 players or so who um had declared themselves eligible as part of the registration process. And since that preliminary list was dropped, 
and more players have you know declared themselves for for the draft and with the deadline uh coming up next monday on the 9th i would anticipate that there's going to be more players who go ahead and and sort of stake their place in in the upcoming drafts um that that's typically what's happened before in the past uh, as someone who has covered multiple drafts at this point both in person and virtually um, I'm very grateful that the deadline is a few days out. I remember covering um, NWSL drafts where the deadline for player registration was literally midnight the, the yeah, day before. Midnight. And um, let me tell you, that's complete. You, If people love chaos and love to tie that in with the NWSL, that absolutely was a, a contributing factor. Um you know, within past drafts before. So uh, hopefully this window of time will maybe clear up some things, uh, you know, in terms of the buildup to the actual draft day on Thursday. Uh, because I think when you look at this uh, registration list as it's compiled right now, it says it was last updated um, on the NWSL website on, on January 2nd. So just in, in after the new year. Um, but I would anticipate that if you're looking at that, you're maybe wondering if if maybe there are some, if there's a player or, or two. If you're wondering if they're still going to to end up on this registration list uh, yeah. and uh, what that might look like come come January 9th for for the deadline. I know folks are are curious. You mentioned the fact uh, how with this draft that there are players who are under the age of 18 who can officially. Um, go ahead and, and declare as eligible for the draft. And, and this is cool to talk about because there have, there have been constant updates to, to the draft um, since its inception with, with NW, with NW Sala, because the whole, let's be real, the whole concept of, of a draft is a very, very American uh, concept. This isn't something that you necessarily see, uh, in other leagues and across the globe and, and with the game. So uh, this is something that is very uniquely American. Yeah. Um, so to sort of uh, go through this draft episode, I'm sure folks will watch this and sort of, you know, want to get some questions hopefully answered and hopefully we can do that for you um, on a three. But I, I like that in this, this iteration of the draft, this version that there is the possibility for players who are younger to go yeah. ahead and declare for, for the draft. And there are obviously, like you mentioned, Lisa, those rules in place um, and structure in place to sort of make sure that there's protections for, for players who are uh, minors in this country, essentially. So uh, we'll see if, if, you know, I'm sure folks are, are looking daily, checking daily. If somebody like Alyssa Thompson is going to, to be on this list, mm -hmm. this is someone who was, um, you know, called into the the last few United States women's national team camps. Uh, is this a player that we might see uh, come January 9th on that deadline? Um, yeah. And, it's, is this a, is, and if she does declare, is this going to be a player that's immediately going to be viewed as a as an overall uh, number one pick? I, I, that's a big question. I am definitely like refreshing the NWSL draft page just because there are a lot of people that um, maybe aren't on there that I was expecting to see. Um, people in our chat shouting out saying that uh, sleepy repeat, A, it's going to be hard to beat last year's draft class. Hey, last year's draft class was really good. We had Naomi Gurman yeah. number one, Jalen Howell, um, Alex Luera. There was some really good draft picks last year, but um Del Morva saying, hey, this is going to be extremely exciting. Can't wait for that. Uh, people are excited that we're going. We're really excited to be there. Um, but it, there's a lot of players that also aren't on the draft list as, as already at this point. Like someone like Jenna Nightswanger from FSU, um, a player that I've been expecting to Register for the draft hasn't yet as of, of the 2nd, January 2nd, but we'll see. Um, but there's also a lot of teams in the NWSL that have some holes to fill, right? When you look at the rosters and the free agency, there's still a lot of question marks surrounding rosters for this league and what's going to happen in the draft is a perfect time to bulk up. No, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Um, I think that's maybe where we have to, to start. Perhaps um, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the draft itself and, you know, what it's going to look like or, or what that what that means. Um, so the the NWSL draft is uh, composed of four rounds and uh, 
within each round, there are going to be 12 picks. So uh, a total of 48 picks that uh, can be made in this uh, in this year's version of the draft. And as of right now, um, again, we're just going off of the, the league website. So uh, bear, bear with us and as some things will likely change in terms yes. of the selection order, specifically starting in the first round. But as of right now, the NWSL first uh, first round of the draft as uh, New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC with the number one overall pick and number two and number three belong to Orlando pride. Uh, number four belongs to racing Louisville FC angel city FC is slotted at number five and number six, North Carolina courage, number seven, Chicago red stars, number eight, Houston dash, number nine, North Carolina courage, number 10, uh, is listed as New Jersey North Gotham FC, but this is again one of those picks where we think could possibly shift to Kansas City Current, depending on um, some conditional things uh, within previous trades between the two sides. Um, but as of the league's website, uh, as of now, it's listed as Gotham for number 10. Uh, number 11, North Carolina Courage, and number 12, Portland Thorns FC. So, um, nearly everyone uh, getting a chance to make a selection in that first round with the exception of possibly Kansas City Kern and uh, San Diego Spirit. FC and Washington Spirit. So uh, three clubs out of the 12 might be getting a look uh, at some players in this first round alone. Yeah, I mean, I think that is where we will see some movement up until there are some like asterisks to this first round draft order about what could change. There are some changes that'll happen um, midnight the night before there are trades that'll be happening during the draft. As most Americans know who have watched drafts previously, not even NWSL drafts, but other drafts as well. I think it would behoove Washington spirit to try to wiggle their way into this first round and make a trade for one of these picks. This is, a team that in Washington spirit that is pretty light on their roster right now. And yeah. as a club that just won the NWSL championship two seasons ago, I think they could get some top talent, but they're not in this first round. Um, I, I think you look at someone like a North Carolina courage that has three picks in this first round. That's impressive to see because they also need to bulk up, right? Like when we look at yeah. the past year and what happened there, maybe only, one or two teams that I'm like, they're going to be fine if they stick with the same roster that they have, or they've made a lot of changes in the off season. I, I look at a team like Kansas city current, what they've been able to do in the off season, getting, um, some forwards getting some midfielders from Chicago Red Stars and Morgan Gatral and Colaprico, they or De Bernardo, excuse me. These are players that, have bulked up the Kansas city midfield. And this is a team that went all the way to the NWSL championship last year and, and the final and then lost to Portland. So they have a good base and they have a good foundation. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see them make some too many crazy picks in this draft. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm curious. Um, we talked about that, that 10 spot, the number 10 uh, pick in, in this first round and, and you bring up Kansas city. I, I'm, I'm looking at some of these teams and I'm curious if, if, if maybe they're interested in in trading out of of this first round, yeah. I think Kansas City is a team that has shown in their short history in the NWSL that uh, they're not intimidated <laughs> um, to to make some headlines in the draft to move some money around, you know, make some ambitious picks. Um, is this the year where we maybe see them continue that trend, or is this the year where we we see them maybe transition? a little bit and sort of see themselves, uh, you know, kind of maybe trade out of that. Are they in a place currently uh, where they want to sort of keep their core intact and continue to build off of what they've already established as, as a franchise? Um, or do they want to continue adding pieces uh, through the draft for, for this roster? So, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at those teams who might not necessarily be in this first round. Are they going to trade in? Or are they going to be content to be, you know, to hold off and maybe make picks in the, in the later rounds. Um, you know, is, is a team like, I, I would also maybe look at North Carolina courage um, yeah. in that aspect, you know, they in, are in a similar position, I think as they were last year, they had a, a number of first round picks for the 2022 draft and they made some really, really good ones. Uh, people obviously were talking about 
the the epic draft class that came out of 2022 and, and Dana Ordonez was a huge part of that for this North Carolina Courage side uh, ended up going on a tear making a, a name for herself as a finalist in, in the rookie of the year candidates um, so I'm curious if if with the handful of picks that they have perhaps do they want to package those are they trying to move higher in the draft are are they content with maybe you know packaging them or trading one or two or all to to to, to trade out or etc um you know i think with with that many in this in this first round i think you maybe have a little bit of, of an advantage there is where you could play is you could still roll your dice in, in the draft or you can you know try to continue to to build with what you've already got with, with the courage because again they they chose a pretty good class in that first round just yeah. just last year do they want to continue to just sort of of, you know, build off of what they are are growing currently um, with with the courage. So I'm I'm eager to see what what head coach uh, Sean Nahas and his and his staff are, are going to do with with these with these picks. Um, but I also look at some uh, a club like Orlando Pride and they've got multiple picks in this draft. Yeah. And I feel a little bit opposite. I don't I don't think they necessarily package those things, uh, those picks to to leverage for for something else. I think with with this draft going number two, going number three, if you're not trying to trade higher for that number one, that you're maybe you want to stay in this category or these two positions right here. If you're a team uh, like the pride that finally gave the nod to Seb Hines, he's officially your head coach and giving the opportunity to build some things from the ground up. I, I, I would hope that the pride stay with these two selections. What do you think? I think that Orlando should keep their selections um, where they are at, at this point because um, the fact that they have these picks, number two and number three, those are really good positionings. Maybe they're a little tough be, um, because they are so high and you are behind Gotham because you don't know what Gotham's going to do at that point if Gotham holds it, right? So if Gotham trades, then Orlando has to juggle this, but it would behoove Orlando Pride to keep those number two, number three picks. They could use some roster strengthening the way that um, Orlando didn't have the best season last year, even the year before. They finished 10th in 2022, uh, but there are some bright lights heading into 2023 season. They've re-signed Brazilian international Marta. They have younger players like Michaela Clough, who have made big impacts last year. Darian Jenkins, who was a, a traded into Orlando at the start of last year that they're looking to build on. And as you mentioned, Seb Hines, the, the new head coach for Orlando Pride, he started to build something at the end of 2022. Can he continue to do that? He's had some time to look at the squad that he has together and figure out what's going to happen, how they can move forward with that. Um, yeah. Or Orlando needs to keep those picks 100% pick up some big players. Um, but I, I mean, I mentioned Washington spirit earlier. This is a club that needs to get some players. They need to get some bodies on their roster. When you look at their current roster right now, goalkeeper position, they have one player listed, Aubrey Kingsbury. Defenders, they have two players rostered, Emily Sonnet and yeah. Staub. They lost Kelly O'Hara, remember? Um, forwards, they've got Ashley Hatch, Trinity Rodman, Tara McKeown, Maddie Elwell. That's four. They, they can't even <laughs> roster a field right now. Uh, Washington Spirit needs to bulk up. They have to. Yeah. They have to. Teams, they have to. Uh, categor like categorizing teams under, you know, clubs who need bodies. It's like Washington Spirit could be one of those clubs. Obviously, Chicago Red Stars, They there's like, huge question marks in their midfield now. Um, yeah. I would even consider like racing Louisville, uh, Angel City, even in some capacity, in some positions uh, to be, you know, a couple of those teams that need bodies, at least in uh, positionally, like on the pitch in certain areas. Yep. Um, so I would maybe have like those four clubs as 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 teams that will want to maybe try to stay within the draft and try or at least try to utilize the draft to, um, you know, make a couple picks and um, continue to, to build some uh, some depth and, and flesh out some of the rosters. Yeah, I think Angel City is a team that I'm really interested to see what Freya Coombe does in the draft this year because when you look at how Angel City did their expansion draft and then the regular draft last year, they definitely acquired good players, but they also acquired players that were dealing with injury, right? So how they are build, being built back into the roster, specifically I'm looking at someone like defender Sarah Gordon, formerly with Chicago and now with Angel City, um, but 
Freya Kuhn in 2022 didn't rotate a lot of players throughout games. She had a very, very short bench that she used. So I honestly wouldn't be too surprised if Angel City doesn't like go gung ho in this draft because they like what they have. They don't like a lot of rotation. Um, could that hurt them in the long run? Yes, I think so. With injuries, with the World Cup year coming up, there's a lot of question marks. Um, but I also think Houston Dash is a team that they could acquire some some heavy hitters in this NWSL draft just with uh, what they have in, in their midfield right now. They've got some namestays in, in Groom, Sophie Schmidt, Marissa Vigiano, but can you book that up? Can you get some depth and, and look at the long game for Houston Dash? Because now that they've got new coach um, there, Sam Lady coming in from OL Reign to take over the Houston Dash team, this needs – it's going to be his first year there and coaching with this squad, but – can he look to the next two years, the next three years? You get some of these draft picks in, even if they're later round draft picks. Um, but that's how you build. That's how you start a new foundation with a new coach at a club that um, is looking to make its return to the playoffs. Yeah, I think that's an important thing to note, too, before we maybe pivot to the actual prospects um, for this draft is is keeping an eye on on those new head coaches, the head coaches with with new teams and how they're going to navigate this draft. So I think Sam Lady with the dash is is a big one to keep an eye on. Obviously, Seb, Seb Hines, this is going to be the you know year one of officially being the head coach and having a full season under your belt as a head coach with the club. Um, I would consider Juan Carlos Amoros as well with, with, with Gotham. Yeah, You're going to be there with, you know, Day, day one of 2023, you know, to the end, how are you going to navigate um, a, a draft moving forward? Uh, even Mark Parsons, you know, I mean, he's mm -hmm. back in the yeah. NWSL, yeah. Uh, but back with, <laughs> with Washington Spirit. And and like you mentioned, there's some there's some holes to fill there. So I'm uh, I'm very, very curious to sort of see, you know, year your draft one, year one head coaches um with, with new teams and, and how they're going to to navigate things. Let's uh Portland let's keep an eye on, too. On those. Huh? Portland Thorns too. Uh, well, I mean Green well, Wilkinson. Yeah, she's not there anymore. So well, what's going to happen in Portland? But Portland's roster Karina also LeBlanc is going to is going to have her work yeah. cut out for her. But you know what? Honestly, Chris Petroselli as well for the Red Stars. This was a head coach yeah. that didn't come in for the Red Stars until well after uh, the NWSL draft. He got hired with the with the club and brought on deep into their preseason. The draft had already happened, so this is technically going to be a first uh, time NWSL draft experience for for him as well. So um, there's a lot. I think about maybe about half of the clubs or so, uh, you know, for sort of first year uh, coaches. And Chicago needs players, right? They you look at the, it's a World Cup year. You look at Mallory Pugh, Mallory Swanson, who will most likely could be going to the World Cup, Alyssa Nair. Um, these are players that you have to have a little bit of depth in those positions and what you're able to do. And they lost their midfield trio, uh, Danny Colaprico, Vanessa DiBernardo, Morgan Gattral. They still have mm -hmm. a lot of players on their roster that maybe fans didn't see at all in 2022 due to maternity leave, due to injuries, uh, due to sicknesses, but they'll be back. So, uh, But they still need to bulk up a little bit. Uh, these coaches have their work cut out for them. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the midfield specifically, right, for Chicago. Yeah. I mean, they went from – you're talking about a, a franchise that went from having what was considered a top three, top four uh, midfield in the league, uh, and in one offseason, that completely being undone, right? So they in free agency, they said farewell to, to Cola Prico, Morgan Gatra, Vanessa DiBernardo, uh, Sarah Waldmo, somebody who, uh, you know, made the decision to retire after, uh, you know – now being a mother and, and giving birth to, to her son. Um, so, you know, one off season, you no longer have uh, those big pieces um, in the midfield that sort of uh, carried you through in so many other seasons um, in the past. So uh, I think that's a pretty glaring area for a team, yeah. uh, team need for them going into this draft. We'll see how they navigate it. We'll talk a little bit more about that, actually. Well, let's go let's get into prospects and who we could maybe see going in this first round or to certain clubs uh, right after a quick break. I've never lost a wingman. You're lucky. Fly long enough, it'll happen. It's been an honor flying with you. I've gotten Maverick. 
PG-13. Now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. All right, let's talk about some of the uh, top NWSL draft prospects heading into the 2023 draft. Uh, a reminder, if you want uh, a look at the live registration list, you can do that on the NWSL website. Registration closes January 9th. It's coming up on a Monday, but uh, there's a ton of registered players already, uh, 178 amongst the list. There's a lot of players there um, to take a look at. But, you know, I know when that preliminary list dropped, you know, we covered that for, for CBSSports.com. You can go check it out. And, and some of the players that stood out for me immediately were players like Reina Reyes, you know, Alabama is the runners up in, in the NCAA state championship. Uh, Messiah Bright, Izzy the Aquila, uh, mm-hmm. Emily Madrill. I mean, there's there's a ton here. I think you can actually flesh out for this draft class at minimum, if not a top 10, at least a top five uh, prospect list for this upcoming draft. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there are definitely top players within this registration list. Um, And some people saying out there, rumors circling around like, hey, this draft class isn't maybe going to be as strong as last year. I disagree. I don't think it it has to do necessarily with um, the depth of of like the top 10, the top 15, the top 20, but how good these individual players are. I mean, you said it, Emily Madrill, the defender uh, who was formerly with Florida State University uh, two seasons ago. This is a player that um, could have been in last year's draft class, maybe, perhaps, but it is going to be in this one uh, just with kind of how everything rolls out. But there's, I, I think that the individual players right in the top five, the top six, six could be potentially more talented than some of the the overall draft picks last year, right, in terms of um, – the skill that they bring and the qualities that they can contribute to these NWSL teams. Um, I mean, some of my top picks that I'm really excited to see, uh, Rena Reyes, defender from Alabama. It, it's We saw a defender go number one the last two years in Naomi Gurma, last year to San Diego, the year before, Emily Fox to Racing Louisville. Um, I, I just... I like this pick. I'm not sure. Number one overall, I'm still waiting for a couple more of the names to trickle in, but um, this is Reyes is a defender that anchored Alabama's back line. She was Mac Herman trophy, semifinalist sec defender of the year. Uh, She had her best season this year in the college cup with Alabama um, Mexican international. She most recently had four caps in the CONCACAF W championship with Mexico. This is a player that has the international experience. She can play at the top level with Alabama. I'm, I really like her. I really like what she did with her time at Alabama and I'm excited to see where she'll go because defenders are needed in this league defenders with experience defenders that have played against top competition that um, have played internationally that adds a whole nother level to her game. I'm I'm smiling the whole time as you're talking about Reyes because of course we're highlighting defenders here on attacking third (laughs) for for players that that we think are top prospects uh, upcoming in this draft, but, but I'm, I'm with you. A hundred percent on, on Reyes. I think she's a really good example of a collegiate program for some people that maybe came out of nowhere. Um, But a really good example of a collegiate program doing a really good job of, of scouting and recruiting and sort of building around certain type of in a couple of players. And Reyna Reyes was absolutely one of those players and somebody who's capable of playing higher up, up the pitch. I I hate to play the comparison game, but there are similar uh, trends that um, on last year's mock board, people were utilizing for a player like Naomi Girma, that this is somebody who has played, you know, positionally in that center center back role is very smart, has a high soccer IQ, uh, but has the ability with really good, you know, the ability to distribute can play a little bit higher up the pitch and perhaps maybe a defensive mid role as well. So I can't help but sort of think about some of the things that people were saying around uh, uh, Naomi Girma last year, and maybe sort of hearing those similar things around a player like uh, Reyes, uh, but Emily Madrill as well, another one of these players um, with the experience as, as a defender uh, coming into this 2023 draft. Um, I think maybe when you're looking at 
examples. I'm saying like Raina is an example of, of a collegiate program that maybe, you know, recruits well, scouts well, and continues to build off of core, a core group of players. Perhaps Madrill is this type of player that you're looking at going into this draft. It could say, who, what are the players coming into this draft who might be quote unquote NWSL ready? Right. And what does that even mean? Yeah. But I think we're looking at a player, um, this player prospect list and absolutely highlighting somebody like uh, Emily Madrill, because this is a player that totally. kind of made headlines a little bit last year in a good way. Um, good headlines. Uh, she's technically was was the first uh, player to, to ever sign a contract directly with the NWSL through 2025, actually, because this is a player who made the decision to forgo the remainder of her NCAA eligibility at Florida State University. And signing a contract with the league provided some room to have her draft rights distributed and not forfeit her total eligibility for this upcoming draft in 2023. And so she ended up going um, on a short loan overseas mm -hmm. uh, playing with uh, BK Haken uh, in Sweden. So we're talking about a player who was with one of those very, very, you know, top collegiate programs in FSU played under market coin, who's in NWSL now with the Washington yep. spirit. And not only did she have that experience with FSU, but she's now got yeah. experience as, as a club professional having played overseas. So I think when you're looking at like list of prospects and you have teams on here who are maybe not just looking for a player to add depth, but a player to come in and make an impact immediately. Like who is that, you know, supposed NWSL ready type player. I think, Emily Madrill is one of these players that you're looking at. You have to look at defender Emily Madrill because of everything you just listed. She has the experience of being a top contender in the NCAA at Florida State under Mark Krikorian. She has the professional experience. It almost puts her at a level of a second or a third year player in the NWSL because of uh, what she was able to do in Sweden, but playing center back there, um, understanding her role, getting a taste of what it's like to play overseas and against top competition internationally. Um, yeah. I mean, I think for her, one of the smartest decisions that she could have made to forego her final year of eligibility, start her professional career, uh, do what, she could do at that time to continue to play. And that was signing with the league on a, and then going on a short-term loan to Sweden to continue playing, getting game experience, um, playing against uh, women that have been competing for years professionally. Um, but as you mentioned, Mark Krikorian, the former FSU head coach, he's now in the front office at Washington Spirit. But I, I predict Emily Madrill going as a top three top four draft pick in this NWSL draft. And as we talked about, Washington Spirit doesn't have a top pick. And uh, there is no doubt that Kirk Corian doesn't want to get Madrill uh, back under playing with him or, or playing on a team that he is overseeing in, in what he's doing now in the NWSL because it's his first time uh, being in the front office of an NWSL team. He would want a little familiarity with the, this type of player. Um, but I – Loved watching her play at FSU. I, I think she'll get drafted pretty high. I'm excited to see what Madrill does, where she goes, kind of how she contributes uh, to a back line. It's, it's interesting, this one, right? We're, we're starting off with our defenders that we've got, Rena Reyes, <laughs> Emily Madrill. we got to hit on some forwards here, Sandra, because out of Santa Clara, forward Izzy Diakia, she's former Gatorade National Player of the Year. She was tied for – goals this year number two in the ncaa uh with 19 goals she's got 50 career goals and 78 appearances the stats for this player are just out of this world um she's good too like a lot of players or a lot of fans might remember her from uh the 2020 national title that happened in the spring uh for santa clara she scored the winning penalty kicks that happened in in the spring of 2021 um she's got an incredible shot she's really powerful she can throw defenders off balance with her footwork and what she's able to do um Player teams that are looking for strikers and looking for forwards that can score, have a nose for a goal, and understanding a winning culture coming out of Santa Clara, I think it's got to be Izzy Diakia for a, a lot of people to circle in this draft. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I, I think when you're looking at, you know, even if if you've got clubs who are you know going through their big boards and and maybe they're just you know you know they have 
things narrowed down to, you know, who are the top forwards in this class or who are the top midfielders or the top defenders in this class. I think when you're looking at the forwards, I think you've got, you know, Izzy Diakia right up there, um, perhaps as number one on um, – on the list of, of top fours. I, I mean, I would include Messiah Bright uh, out of yeah. TCU, um, you know, as one of the top forwards in this draft class, um, made some history, you know, with the, uh, with TCU scored 49 goals in, in the entirety of her career with TCU. I think that's just one short of, of uh, Diakia who had 50 with, with Santa Clara. Yeah. So, um, you know, definitely a, definitely a standout, you know, for, for that program. And, you know, similar to, um, Diakia has, has experience in, um, you know, with us youth teams. So I think when you, when you have all of those, all of those bullet points, right. Like on your resume, I think you're maybe looking at two of the, the top two kind of potential, um, forwards, uh, you know, for, for prospects, but I mean, there's, there's a ton. I mean, there's, there's Hawking, there's Hopkins, um, Filippo, yep. um, within this as well. There's, there's a number of, of players, I think if teams are looking for forwards that they can go through and, and make a, a, a solid pick um, through, yeah. throughout their, throughout the draft. Yeah. I, I like your shout for Messiah bright. I think kind of coupling her with Izzy Diakia is at, nice to kind of compare those two because they are similar, um, but coming from different programs, right? Santa Clara, TCU, um, but the international experience that they have playing with the U.S. youth teams. I mean, you look at Messiah Bright. She got the U23 call up in 2022 for the women's national team. Um, her NCAA tournament experience, five straight for TCU, two-time All-American, Big 12 tournament, most outstanding player. Like this player has a lot of accolades and it, that's something that teams also have to look at, but then take into stride. Who was around these players? What happened with them? Um, it, were they the only superstar on their team for three years, or were they coupled with a lot of other players that really helped contribute to them, and they still stood out among the top of the top? Um, I, I'm not sure if you even mentioned uh, Nicole Douglas. I think this is an interesting player out of Arizona State. She's a forward She's from London, and we talked about it at the top of the show. Drafts are an American thing, uh, but she has registered for this draft. She played for Chelsea growing up. Uh, she had an incredible, an incredible junior year in 2021 at Arizona State. She was the most prolific goal scorer in the country uh, in 2021 for that season. 2022, she kind of trailed off a little bit, uh, didn't maybe gain as much momentum from the, her junior year, probably as she would have liked. 14 goals in 2022, but she's incredibly physical. Um, she can play anywhere along the front line. I, I saw her play as a striker. I saw her play as a winger at Arizona State. Uh, but I, I think the inconsistency going from her junior year to her senior year is a little bit of a question mark. But again, you have to look at the team around these players. You have to look at the competition that they played up against and, and someone like Nicole Douglas um, you know it's in her right to, to be the top most prolific goal scorer in the country um, and then to still get 14 the next year perhaps the scouting reports were just a little bit tougher on Douglas heading into her senior year but this is someone that I think it'll be really interesting to see how Douglas enters the draft as as a London native um played with Chelsea growing up and, and to see that she wants to stay in the States and she wants to play in the NWSL, not go home and play in, in the super league or anywhere else she could. No, I'm with you. I think even like looking at some of the players out of university of Virginia could, could be, um, you know, players who can provide and for, for NWSL offenses, if they're, if they're looking for players to go ahead and, and get involved, um, in the attack. So, um, I'm eager to see if, if, you know, Alexis Spancher is going to be on, on this list of players. This is someone who I think was rumored last year to, to possibly declare early for the 2022 draft. Um, or, you know, now that she's officially declared for 2023, will she be high on some of those draft boards uh, coming up uh, in, in this, in this particular uh, 2023 draft, but uh, we'll see. Uh, there is still uh, a ton of time left between now and Monday for uh, the NWSL registration draft deadline to close. So maybe we'll see some more names on this list. Maybe there will be some more prospects uh, who will, you know, go ahead and, and declare themselves eligible for the 2023 draft. Breaking news, the United States Women's National Team January camp roster just 
dropped. We are going to go live to chat about that in our live reactions, but we're going to give ourselves a little bit of a window of time and a break for everybody, ourselves and you all to join us a little bit later to chat about the United States women's national team roster. Thanks for joining us for our NWSL draft board. Thank you all so much for listening to Attacking Third. Download Follow, listen to us anywhere you get your live podcast. You can watch us too. Subscribe at youtube.com slash attacking third. And make sure you join us later when we go live to talk the United States women's national team January camp roster. For Sandra and Lisa Roman, this was Attacking Third.